Hey brothers and sisters, today we're going to be skipping from all the Catholics straight to the Reformation. Well, at least the start of it. It was a subtle start. Well, actually, no, it wasn't a subtle start, but it started with John Wycliffe. He lived from 1330 to 1384. Here's the pictures of him. There's a picture of John Wycliffe. And then also, um, here is, um, it says he became master over Balliol College. That's what that looks like. And then also, here's a picture from the Wycliffe Bible, which is impossible to read. Because it's super weird looking. And then also there's a Lutterworth Parish Church in Lectyshire. Oh, sorry, I didn't even think I showed it right. And I think that's it. Yep. So let's go ahead and get right into the right into the um, book. John Wycliffe is sometimes known as the morning star of the Reformation. He lived during the 14th century, a time when the Roman Catholic Church was suffering from increasing corruption. Wycliffe was one of the great thinkers of his age and wrote many important works in the areas of philosophy and theology. But he did not confine himself to the academic life. In his 40s, Wycliffe became involved in politics, siding with the government in its disputes with the papacy. During that time, his views became increasingly radical, as he questioned a number of accepted Catholic beliefs. Just when Wycliffe's ideas became most radical, the political situation changed, and his government no longer required his services. Wycliffe's views were condemned, and he had to retire to a country parish. There he continued to write and encourage those seeking reform. His followers translated the Bible into English and went out to preach. Those so-called lollards were fiercely persecuted, and the movement was driven underground. But Wycliffe's ideas spread to Bohemia, where they could be held more openly. In England, they paved the way for the Protestant Reformation, which came some 150 years after Wycliffe's death. John Wycliffe and the Rev Morning Star of the Reformation, A.N.S. Lane. Oxford's leading theologian. John Wycliffe was born into a propertied English family about 1330. He went to Oxford University to study and by 1360 had become master of Balliol College. This was not as prestigious then as it was now. Wycliffe was still working for his M.A. degree. The following year he earned the degree and was ordained. He thereupon relinquished the mastership in favor of the more advantageous, advantageous position of rectorship at a Lincoln, of a Lincoln Charter Church. Wycliffe thus became, and remained for most of his life, an absentee pers parson. This was considered acceptable in those days, especially as a way of financing academic studies. But it was the responsibility of the absentee rector to provide a substitute to perform his duties. It is not known how conscientious Wycliffe was, of, was in these regard. By 1370, Wycliffe had become Oxford's leading philosopher and theologian. He had also come to hold radical ideas on lordship, which he wrote in his book, Civil Dominion. Here he maintains, on the one hand, that the ungodly have no right to rule, and on the other hand, that the godly man possesses all the wealth in the universe. The first point is, is simple to prove. All the lordship is granted by God, but he does not grant it to those who are in rebellion against him. Again, those who rule unjustly are in breach of the terms under which God delegates authority, and so have forfeited all right to rule. The second point follows from the fact that the godly man is God's son, and so shares in his lordship. These claims plainly have the most radical social implications. On the one hand, they justify the rejection of the unjust rulers and the confiscation of their goods. On the other hand, the, unifer, the universal lordship of the godly has important implications. This lordship must be shared with the rest of the godly, which leads to a form of biblical communism. In practice, Wycliffe's ideas were not nearly so radical. He recognized that we cannot here and now judge who is elect and distinguish with certainty between the elect and the reprobate. But on the other hand, he maintained that those who lead blatantly sinful lives do forfeit their rights in this world. In particular, he applied this theory to the clergy of his time. 
they were so corrupt that the secular authorities had the right to confiscate church properties. This teaching was of obvious interest to the state. Wycliffe and John of Gaunt During Wycliffe's time, the church was immensely wealthy, owning about one-third of all the land of Egypt, England, and yet it claimed exemption from taxation. Wycliffe's doctrines were a suitable threat to be used to extract taxes out of a reluctant clergy at a time when the king had to finance an expensive war with France. They could negotiate, I mean, they could also be used in negotiations with the papacy over the pope's alleged right to tax the English clergy to finance his own wars. Wycliffe was in a delegation, I mean, yeah, was in a delegation sent to Bruges in 1374 to negotiate with papal authorities. During the 1370s, Wycliffe enjoyed the favor and support of the government, especially of John of Gaunt, who was the Duke of Lancaster and one of the most powerful people in England. But Wycliffe's doctrines also came to the ears of the Pope, who in 1377 condemned 18 of Wycliffe's statements in a series of bulls. That year, English, the English bishop tried to put Wycliffe on trial at St. Paul's Cathedral, but John of Gaunt intervened on his behalf. The following year, everything changed for Wycliffe. That year saw the election of a rival pope and the beginning of the 40-year Great Schism, with two or more popes confronting one another throughout the period. That drastically weakened the power of the papacy, with important implications for Wycliffe. On the one hand, the government no longer needed his dangerously radical ideas in order to subdue the clergy, but on the other hand, the papacy was so preoccupied with other issues and so left Wycliffe to his own devices. This was very convenient for Wycliffe, as about this time he began to develop more radical ideas, which at any other time in the Middle Ages would have spelled his doom. These ideas led to a loss of favor with the government, but his former patrons continued to exert enough pressure on his behalf to protect him from the attacks on the Eng of the English clergy. Another trial at Lambeth in 1378 was thwarted by the Queen's mother support for Wycliffe. Wycliffe condemned. In 1378, Wycliffe retired from public life to continue his studies at writing in writing at Oxford. The bishops put increasing pressure on the university to act against his radical ideas, but such pressure was at first resisted. In 1381, however, there was a peasant's revolt, and one of its leaders, John Ball, was reported to be a disciple of Wycliffe. Wycliffe disowned the result, revolt, but the damage was done. Furthermore, the rebels had killed the Archbishop of Canterbury, and his place was taken by William Courtenay, a long-standing opponent of Will Wycliffe. The following year, Courtenay called a council that condemned 24 of Wycliffe's statements. During the council, there was an earthquake. Wycliffe interpreted it as a sign of divine displeasure with the outcome, while Courtenay claimed that the land was breaking wind of Wycliffe's foul heresy, heresies. Shortly after the peasants' revolt, Wycliffe withdrew to Lutterworth in Lectishire, where he had been at the absentee rector since 1374. There he devoted himself to writing for his few remaining years. In 1382, he suffered a stroke. In December 1384, he suffered a second stroke and died a few days after, on New Year's Eve. Why did Wycliffe's ideas cause so much controversy? He was by no means the first person in the Middle Ages to protest against the corrupt, corrupt practices of the Church. Where he broke new ground was the at in attacking the doctrines that underlay their practices. This was already true of his theories of lordship, but from 1378, he went on to attack some of the key doctrines of the contemporary church. Wycliffe and Scripture In 1378, Wycliffe wrote the truth of the Holy Scripture. Here he maintains, in accord with church teaching, that the Scriptures are true, that is, free from error or contradiction. But more than this, he claims that the Bible contains the whole, the whole of God's revelation. There is no need for any further teaching to be supplied by church tradition, the Pope, or any other source. Scripture contains all that is necessary for salvation. Furthermore, all authorities, such as tradition, canon, canon law, councils, and even popes, must be tested by the Scriptures. 
The Bible is the ultimate norm by which all other teaching must be tested. Here, Wycliffe clearly anticipates the position of the Reformers. Finally, the Bible is to be available to all Christians, the laity as well as the clergy. If the Bible is to be available to all, it clearly follows that it must be translated into the vernacular, the common language of the people. Wycliffe states as much in his other works. And so it was that Wycliffe's disciples translated the Bible into English. But what, we what was Wycliffe's role in the production of the Wycliffe Bible, no one knows for sure. It is certain that he was produ it was produced by his disciples under his influence. It is quite likely, but not certain, that he played some supervisory role in the translation. The tradition that he actually took part in the translation is possible, but far from certain. Wycliffe and the Papacy As well as exalting the role of the Bible, Wycliffe also downgraded the papacy. At that time, Europe was confronted with the unedifying un spectacle of rival popes anathematizing each other. The time was ripe for a re-examination of the role of the pope. In 1379, Wy Wycliffe wrote The Power of the Papacy, in which he argues that the papacy is an office instituted by man, not by God. Furthermore, the Pope's authority is confined to the Church and does not extend to a secular government. More important, the Pope's authority is not automatic, but depends on his having moral character of Peter. In Wycliffe's time, such a statement implied the rejection of nearly all recent Popes. A Pope who does not follow Jesus Christ as the Antichrist, claimed Wycliffe. Later, Wycliffe went one step further, branding not just bad Popes, but the institution of the papacy itself as Antichrist. Where Wycliffe shocked his contemporaries was most in his rejection of the doctrine of the transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, sorry. Wycliffe did not deny in some sense that Christ's body and blood are present in the Eucharist. Transubstantiation is one particular way in which Christ's presence is explained. It is the belief that the substance of the bread is changed into the substance of Christ's body, while the accidents of the bread, their physical characteristics, remain. Wycliffe rejected this doctrine on a number of grounds. It was, recent it was a recent innovation, having been promul promulgated in the 13th century. It was a philosophy incoherent. It was contrary to scripture. From 1379, Wycliffe repeatedly attacked some transubstantiation transubstantiation. He notes in a sermon that honest citizens do not let friars enter their wine cellars for the fear they might bless the wine and turn every barrel into mere accidents. Wycliffe believed that the bread and the wine remain after their consecration. They become the sacraments of Christ's body and blood. Body and blood. Christ's body is present in the bread in the same way that my soul is present in my body. In some sense, Christ's body is present everywhere in the bread. It is not altogether clear what Wycliffe meant at this point, and his support has been claimed for both the Lutheran and Calvinistic doctrines. The Lollards Wycliffe's disciples were called Lollards, an abusive term meaning mumblers. Wycliffe himself was left in unhindered, but after his death, action was taken against his followers. At first, he had disciples among the nobility and the scholars, but persecution largely eliminated these. In 1414, there was an aberrative Lollard rebellion, which led to further repression. After this Lollardy became an underground lower class movement, studies have shown that there was a real continuity between Lollardy and the rise of Protestantism in the 16th century. The Lollards helped to pave the way for the English Reformation in the 16th century by spreading the English Bible and fueling discontent with the Roman Church. Wycliffe's ideas were also influential elsewhere in Europe. Some of his pupils at Oxford came from Bohemia, modern-day Czechoslovakia, and took copies of his work from them, home from them, home with them, sorry. Wycliffe's teaching influenced the rise of dissent in Bohemia, association especially with the name of John Hoos. Hoos was burnt at the Council of Constance in 1415. The council also condemned 45, quote, errors of Wycliffe. In 1428, his bones were dug up and burned. 
A later chronicle comment, chronicler commented, quote, They burned his bone to ashes and, count the, and cast them into the swift, a neighboring brook running hard by. Thus, the brook conveyed his ashes into the Avon, the Avon of the Severn, and the Severn into the narrow seas, and they, may, they into the main ocean. And so the ashes of Wycliffe are now symbolic of his doctrine, which is now spread throughout the world. So I hope hearing about this guy, um, that God will use it to edify you, to be bold in the faith of Christ against the heresies of this modern world, in which there are many. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.